important uh, topic. Uh, the media is most strong Sri Lanka, supporting the nationalization in the era of war and terror, or war and terrorism. Uh, it is a subject that is very close to, to my research uh, and to some of the things that I, uh, I did in the past uh, when I was really active in, in journalism, when I was a, a journalist. Although I still consider myself a journalist. Uh, so I, what I've told is I will really be drawing on my, a little from, from my research and then a little on my, my experience uh, as a journalist in Sierra Leone. Uh, there are some parallels, of course, between the conflict in Sierra Leone uh, that lasted for about uh, uh, almost over, a little over a decade and the conflict in Sri, in Sri Lanka, although there are a few differences. Um, so I will be really drawing some, uh, uh, some, some, I will be drawing on that, and then I will be drawing on the research that I've done uh, recently also, uh, culminating into some publications like the Human Rights Journalism, Advances on Reported Distant Material uh, Interventions, and uh, on some other recent, recent projects that I've been involved with. Uh, so I will try and really focus on look at war on terror within the perspective of Africa, looking particularly uh, at the Sri Lankan case study, and how it relates to the Sri Lankan case study. So what I've done, I, I, there are some few areas that I'll be touching on um, to look at that, because I think it's, it's, it's an area that has really not been explored. Uh, so, so first of all, I just want to start by by talking about a piece of research I did that culminated into an article I did for Journal of African Media Studies, uh, in which I looked at uh, the war on terror uh, phrase, uh, you know, by particularly Western media. I did a, I did a study of uh, a kind of a content analysis and uh, a frame analysis, looking at the coverage of the conflict in Sierra Leone. Uh, by the Washington Post. And there was a particular journalist that I studied uh, called uh, Douglas Farah. He was a reporter for West Africa for a very long time during the conflict. And I kind of looked at how, you know, uh, the, his coverage <coughs> that focused particularly in linking blood diamond, the blood diamond trade that was carried out by uh, the, the women group in Syria called uh, the Revolutionary United Front you know, uh, that he published just after the terrorist attack on the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center on September 11, 2001, kind of, uh, you know, signaled a kind of a major shift in U.S. foreign policy from that of withdrawal to engagement in African <coughs> crisis. Uh, because just before the, uh, the, the, the terrorist attack in, in New York, uh, there was less engagement in Africa. There was... Uh, a kind of, because uh, following the post uh, uh, Cold War period, we found out that you know there was less engagement with what, what was happening in Africa because there was no enemy. You know, the end of communism signaled you know the end of uh, engagement of the West. You know, they didn't care very much about Africa. They didn't care more, very much about countries that were involved in conflicts, not only in Africa but even in Asia, because uh, there was no communism. There was no monster. There was no common enemy, you know. So the focus kind of shifted. So, uh, th so there was less attention. That was why the war in Sierra Leone raged for a very long time. You know, interest was only <coughs> shown in the war in, in Sierra Leone towards the end of uh, the 90s, early 2000s. You know, that was just after the the, the, the attack on the World Trade Center. So I was particularly interested in this shift. And so I did that uh, to look at how that affected, how that kind of changed. And Sri Lanka was very much at the center of that shift. So that was what I looked at in that article. So I want to look at the broader context of that. You know, uh, following the Cold War era, mainstream media discourse of Western intervention was gradually uh, dominated by the consolidation of uh, victory of democracy and open markets. You know, the emphasis was more you know, how, how can we use democracy, Western democracy and open markets, the open market economy, you know, countries that we are following these particular, uh, you know, uh, uh, strands uh, to use that to make them to become our friends, 
and that was very much uh, you know what was what was going on. And uh, but this uh, you know uh, so the friends of uh, the big Western powers, you know, we are much more or less determined on the basis of this. Who are really following the Western democracy? Who are really following uh, you know the, the market economy? If for instance, countries that are not following that, they are not considered to be friends, you know, or part of the free world, if you like. Uh, but the end of the Cold War actually witnessed a dramatic shift of Western foreign policy, which saw the abandonment of most, if not all, the traditional allies in Africa, as they are no longer considered to be of any strategic interest, since there was then really no perceived global enemy to deal with. So this is the kind of the general context. But well, as I said, there was a significant departure with the increase in perception in the Western intelligence circles of the nexus between the conflicts in Africa and terrorism. You know, this kind of this developed very quickly, you know, fully post 9/11. And uh, <coughs> more to the point, I really want to uh, make an argument here, which I made in this article, that uh, the dispatches by Washington Post, uh, then West Africa Bureau Chief Douglas Farah especially that title, Al-Qaeda Cash, tied to diamond trade, sale of gems from Sierra New Rivers, raised millions, sources say. And this was published on the, on the 2nd of November, 2011. Uh, linking the blood diamond trade carried out by Sierra Leone's Rivers movement, the RUA, that is the Revolutionary United Front, to Al-Qaeda, uh, published just two months after the terrorist attack the Twin Towers, because the terrorist attack happened in September, and this article came out in November, just two months, you know, kind of uh, uh, had some far-reaching implications for an apparent shift in U.S. foreign policy in Africa. You see? So the argument I'm making here, which I made here, is that Douglas Farah's framing of Syrian terror after the 9-11 terrorist attacks contributed in reviving the interests of, Afri of, 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 of the West in Africa's context. You know, this, this was, so we are talking about war on terror here. How did it all uh, start? Nine days after the 9 11 terrorist attack, US President John Bukwok Kapush, in his State of the Union address, announced his intention to declare a global war on terror. He said, and I quote, our war on terror begins with Al Qaeda. And he continued, but it does not end there. It will not end until every terrorist group of global reach has been found, stopped, and defeated. You know? And he continued by saying that uh, you know, if you are not with us, that is, if you are not part of the alliance, you know, that he kind of was the I mean, that he developed, if you are not part of that alliance, then it was it that meant that you were against us, you know, something like that. You are either with us or against us, you know, that kind of message. And uh, the resonance of that message, kind of, the impact of that message was, too, was, was very much felt across, across the globe. You know, it was a, a frame that has since really defined, not only acts of terrorism narrowly defined, but also all conflicts involving direct political violence, ranging uh, from uh, civil wars, interstate wars, to violent riots and demonstrations, you know, uh, it kind of changed the way people mediated, you know, such conflicts, such uh, uh, situations. And uh, it was quite, and it actually is a definition that also, also played very quickly into the hands of totalitarian leaders in the world, engaged in battles uh, with uh, dissidents in their countries. And one of such leaders who really, who really comes to mind is the Sri Lankan president, Mahinda Rajapaksa, Paksa, whose speech in 2007, quite interesting, the framing of the war on terror rhetoric, a speech by Bush, and a speech by, this, uh, by the Sri Lankan president in 2007, you know, at the height <coughs> of the Sri Lankan civil war, that was more or less, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, what I call the, the war on terror rhetoric. And I quote his speech then, that is the president, the Sri Lankan president. He said, at this decisive moment, I wish to make one request of you. 
I ask this of all political parties, all media, and all people's organizations. You decide whether you should be with a handful of terrorists or with a common man who is in the majority. So you must clearly choose between these two sides. No one can represent both sides at any one time. So you see the framing, very much parallel, parallel framing between the two. You know, and you can quickly figure out how, you know, totalitarian readers copied uh, the message <coughs> that Bush used just after 9/11, <coughs> and this was just one of them. Uh, there were many others. And the, what I want to ask is how, you know, the question, the question that actually is raised here is, who then is the terrorist? This is this is a very big uh, claim. You know, who is a terrorist? It kind of raises the question of the identification of terrorists. Is it, for instance, possible to tell the difference between a terrorist and a freedom fighter in any given conflict situation? You know, this is this is something that has really occupied the minds of. Uh, uh, researchers, not just in media, but uh, across the uh, other fields. And uh, I just want to quote McCobrey, Mac uh, writing in 1997. He made a very a kind of a very interesting argument. He said, the way we perceive acts of violence carried out by groups such as the Palestinians, the Kashmiris, the Tamil Tigers, the Northern Irish, the Northern Irish uh, Republicans can vary really from one place to another. It kind of uh, reinforces the famous cliche that one man's terrorist is another man's uh, freedom fighter. And uh, this is quite interesting. And looking at the politics of terrorism, broadly speaking, it therefore informs the decisions by states and state leaders to perceive an act of terrorism and the person of or person carrying it as terrorist or, or you know, and this is, so, it is a subject, to, this is a kind of a subject that uh, that it changes in accordance to changing political and ideological alliances. You know, sometimes somebody is perceived as a terrorist. Uh, you know, maybe just because he is not a friend, he is not a, a kind of participating, or he is not collaborating with uh, uh, the uh, part of the mainstream. You will say he's a troublemaker, so therefore he's a terrorist. Even if that person is trying, is caught a very just cause, trying to push certain things. For instance. Uh, there are people who are perceived to be terrorists, like Saddam Hussein, Osama bin Laden, uh, the, 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 the Taliban, and others. You know, they were recently, recently, recently described as terrorists. But when you look at back, back in history, you realize that they were at one stage here as friends of the West. You know, and so it depends on how the contours of politics change or geopolitics change, and then people can be referred today as uh, friends and then tomorrow as enemies or as terrorists. And this can be very uh, worrying in the present circumstances. Uh, so uh, I, I want to kind of look at this definition of terrorism. I want to bring it a bit closer to journalism, journalists. How are journalists per perceived as terrorists? I mean, this can be very challenging, particularly when you look at journalists operating in conflict areas. It, it happened in my country. I experienced it first time. And it's really happened also in Sri Lanka and other places. I was involved in a, in a project. In fact, I was really leading on that project in 2007. I was then doing my postdoc in Bristol. And we, invite, we, we organized a conference. Uh, I was then part of the Exile Journalist Network in London, here in London. Uh, and uh, it attracted a lot, a very large audience of Sri Lankans in London. I think very few people here in this room might have been really taken part in that uh, meeting. It was held at the House of Commons, Queen's House. It was quite interesting uh, because we we really tried to invite not just Tamil journalists, although of course the topic was uh, press freedom, uh, reporting, uh, peace reporting, and democracy uh, in. in Sri Lanka, and but we tried to kind of invite journalists uh, across the two uh, ethnic groups, the Tamils and the and the and the Sinhalese. There were a few two Sinhalese journalists. In fact, two of them who did not uh, kind of they, they they were more they were sympathetic, you know, to press freedom. So uh, although most of the people who were really persecuted were really uh, Tamil journalists, but. We invited two other people, like, like Bandara and like Sunandra. Uh, Sunandra was involved in 
free movement of for press freedom. You know, I think I understand it's not based in Sweden or, or uh, I don't know in, in, in one of the Nordic countries. But we invited him. He came, and then Bandara was working for the BBC. He also came, and uh, there are some other Tamil journalists we invited. Uh, it was quite interesting to hear from those who who kind of ex explained, you know, the the, the stories you know, of persecution and how they were branded as terrorists just because they were doing their job, you know. And uh, this was really unfortunate uh, because you, you realize that uh, journalists are just, they just go about doing their job, reporting uh, and, you know, trying to really explain what is really going on. And then they are targeted just because maybe they belong to a particular school of thought that is not supportive of the mainstream discourse. And that can be a little challenging. And uh, but something that really uh, shocked me is after the conf after the meeting, uh, we received a very uh, kind of we received an attack. A letter, I mean, a, a letter was sent uh, to us, you know, attacking us. Now we organized a conference, you know, uh, taking the position of the Tamil. We are kind of more pushing the Tamil cause, you know. We are, you know, which was really unfortunate because uh, that was not our intention. Our intention was really to try and and look at the situation, broadly speaking, the situation of press freedom you know, in, in Sri Lanka and how to, to kind of provoke a kind of a debate. You know, that was why we did not just invite people from the Tamil side, we invited also people from uh, uh, the, side, the Sinhalese side, where everybody was united in one, that there were press freedom violations. And we were concerned about how we can we provoke a debate to make sure that issues of press freedom violations are looked into and addressed. See, and uh, and, and that, that was our concern, but uh, we were misunderstood. And this can be, uh, in a way, we were branded as terrorists, which was really unfortunate, because we were branded as if we were supporting uh, the, the, the Tamil, uh, you know, the people who were then branded as terrorists, you know, the Tamil fighters and so forth. So it, it, was, it was really very, you know, so it, it means uh, journalists can easily be branded as terrorists just because they don't support a particular cause. You know, they don't support a particular kind of maybe persecution of, uh, of journalists. They oppose, so they can, you can be branded very easily. You know, and this brings me to something very similar that happened in my country uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the 90s, in the late 90s, when I was active there as a journalist. I was uh, the editor of, a, of an award-winning newspaper, Expo Times, and. Uh, there was something that really, there are a lot of things that happened, but uh, more centered on this idea of, you know, professional objectivity and, uh, and honesty. You know, uh, how can you balance the two? You know, you want to be objective, but of also you want to be honest in what you do. Uh, you you are. It's very difficult to just be an objective journalist in a situation of conflict, where you know there are kind of. Uh, uh, <coughs> Issues of injustice, you know, issues of uh, violence against targeted against uh, innocent people, you know, we have innocent people paying for uh, uh, things that they really didn't know about and so forth. So, so how do you balance that as a journalist? And you know, I kind of I was caught up in a situation. Uh, I re I realized that most Sri Lankan journalists also found themselves in similar situation. You know, you are in a situation that you are seeing injustice. How can you be neutral? You know, in the face of evil. And I want to quote here Martin Bell, the BBC journalist who worked in, in, uh, in, 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 the, in the, he covered the Bosnian conflict for a very long time before he retired and became a politician. You know, he said, and I quote him, that you cannot be neutral between uh, the, 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 the devil and the angel. You can't. You know, you can't be neutral. It's very difficult to be neutral as a journalist. I mean, uh, you have to attach somewhere. You have to belong to, to people you have to associate yourself with the, the people who are persecuted. You know, it's, it's very normal because you want you want to have a, a, a fair playing ground. You cannot support the perpetrators, you know, of evil. You can't. It's very difficult. So you want to you want to be seen to be advocating something that is positive. You know, and yet when you try and do that, you are accused. You know, you are branded to be a collaborator of that particular because they will say because you are not supporting. Uh, uh, the violent, uh, the, the violent uh, intervention or the violent uh, means of resolving the conflict. You are supporting peace. 
you know, not necessarily, you are not supporting, for instance, any group. But just because of you are interested in peace and not war, you know, you are considered, because there are some people who make a lot of money when there are wars, you know, they will not like you. And then you are easily branded as, a, as part of uh, the problem, because they will say that you, you, you are interested in peace, but we are interested in war, because it's war that is keeping us there. Because when we have more wars, you know, it means there are certain political stakes, you know, there are certain uh, issues, there are certain people who benefit a lot, you know, from the political economy aspect, you know, politicians benefit because they use it to sustain themselves in power for a very long time. And the businesses, the people who, who, who supply the arms, you know, they, they want the wars to continue. So there are a lot of interests at play here. But you have these journalists, you know, you, you, want, to, you want to stay out of it. And that is, that is something, and then you are, you are branded. And it happened many times uh, in, uh, in Sierra Leone. I just want to give you one example that happened. There was a case of uh, an article that my assistant editor wrote. <coughs> it was published in my newspaper. And, uh, and that article was just a simple opinion article, you know, criticizing the arrest of the rebel leader in uh, Abuja, then uh, uh, Fodi Sanko, who was, uh, because uh, there was a peace process that was in place, which was signed in Abidjan in 1996. And the peace process was on course, you know, and it was going to deliver the peace. But the arrest of this particular guy in, in Nigeria, you know, kind of reversed the peace process. And the opinion article was basically trying to, to critique the arrest, how it was reversing the peace process. And yet, we, 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 three of us were arrested and detained for a month, uh, refused bail five times when we were taken to court. And uh, we, so we were kind of persecuted just for somebody expressing their opinion. You know? So it was really unfortunate. And then we were charged for the first time, and the only time in Sierra Leone, we were charged for spying, espionage. It's the first and only time journalists have ever been charged in Sierra Leone for spying. And we did not leak any defense secret, for instance, if you like, you know, that really made them to. We just, it was just an opinion. So, so just to give you an idea of how, 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 how things really deteriorated within that aspect. So, so uh, it was really an unfortunate uh, situation. So I want to kind of, so in this case, you want to be honest, and then you want to, you want to say the truth, and you want to advocate a particular cause, but you, you become a victim, and it's really unfortunate. So I want to just conclude by, by uh, talking about uh, peace uh, journalism as it relates to human rights journalism, and how when you are trying to advocate, you are trying to be honest, you are trying to bring change through your journalism, you are persecuted, and then. Uh, so more or less, you are trying to practice human rights journalism, you are trying to uh, practice peace journalism. But uh, it can be very difficult within the context of the mainstream uh, media. And uh, the mainstream media, most, time, most of the time, they enjoy the support of the politicians and the, 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 the economic forces. And one last thing I want to say before I, I, uh, I finish is I want to, I want to talk about uh, <coughs> this responsibility to protect uh, within the context of journalism. Uh, journalists are, are supposed to be duty. They are supposed to be at the responsibility. You know, uh, when you talk about a responsibility to protect, the emphasis has mostly been on the states and the international community. There has been less emphasis on the individual and the journalists. You see, the journalists are not seeing themselves. They are just seeing themselves to be people who are supposed to be neutral. And I disagree. You know, uh, I feel that the journalists should also see themselves as duty bearers. After all. Journalists draw their inspiration from, from, from human rights, you know, from Article 19. You know, they, gain their, they get their freedom there, and they have to be responsible to the public. You know, and being responsible is doing the right thing, you know, using their journalism to, to push for justice, for, to push for global justice, to push for social justice, and not be neutral in the face of injustice, you know, and justice. I think it's better to take the position of justice than injustice as a journalist. So uh, that's why what I emphasize here in this book, human you know, rights journalism. And I looked at a lot of case studies in Sierra Leone, uh, in Eastern Europe, you know, and other places, in Somalia, Rwanda, uh, looking at just how the journalists can be more active than passive in the face of injustice and, uh, and, and justice. You know, it's always better for journalists to go, to take the, the justice uh, route 
instead of the injustice road. Because we are supposed to be watchdogs. You know, we are supposed to be watchdogs of society to make sure that human wrongs are not committed. You know, whether in the context of the corporate uh, uh, inter uh, sector or the political sector. You know, so that's what I, I, I want to say. And I want to admonish journalists across the, the, the board, not just Tamil journalists, but also Sinhalese journalists, or journalists generally, global journalists, to really consider that, that we are there not just to, 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 to inform, but we are there also to change society, to make society better, to make the world a better place to live. I thank you very much.